There is no dream that you can dream that the power that is God, regardless of what name you call it by, has not dreamed bigger for you. So let's just, for the sake of everybody being on the same page, let's use life for God. Life has dreamed a dream for you. And your, your goal, your number one job is to figure out what that dream is and align yourself with the dream. Because the dream cannot come to you unless you're willing to meet it energetically in the same place. So if your energy is off, if you are not in flow with God's dream for you, with life's dream for you, if you are out of order, if you are out of sync, it cannot come to you. It will not come because the whole purpose of your life is to line yourself up with the purpose. And so if you are operating in fear, if you are operating in uh, jealousy, je jealousy will kill you. Any, any kind of anger or jealousy you have about anybody else. So here are a couple laws I have. The first law is the third law of motion in physics, which says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And we showed that very beautifully in the color purple. When Miss Seeley says to Mr. Everything you even try to do to me is already done to you. That is not just a, a rhetorical saying, that is law. That is Newton's third law of motion in physics, which says everything that goes out is coming back. It's just like everything that goes up is coming down, may take it a long time to come down, is coming down. <laughs> everything that goes out is coming back, it's coming back. So to answer the power of manifestation and meditation, what meditation does is sync you up with the source. What meditation does is allows you to literally tap into the power that created you so that you are in alignment with that. And so when you carry that out into the world, everything that you do comes from the center of that alignment that's coming from the source that we call God, we call divine energy, divine intelligence, whatever name you want to give it to, we call life. When you are synced up with life, life just gives to you. It opens doors, it creates experiences, it allows you to meet people, things show up you never thought were gonna show up, and you are doing what is the purpose of your soul being here. So one of my favorite teachers is Gary Zukov who says that authentic power is when you learn to use your personality, which I've done very well, Use your personality to serve the energy of your soul. So you are the bigger soul that has a personality. When you figure out how to take, I have a big personality. It's lovely, it's charming, but it's not me. It's not me. I'm here to do my soul's work. And I use my personality to serve the soul's work. And because I know what the soul's work is, I heard somebody ask earlier about what should you be praying. The prayer is use me. You are here to be used as a vessel from the source from which you have come. And if, and everybody has a different talent, and the reason we're all so messed up is because you're looking at everybody else's yeah. talent yeah. and wishing you had some of their talent. All the energy that you spend thinking about, wishing about, being jealous of, envious of anybody else is energy that you're not only putting out, it's going to come back to you negatively, but you're taking that away from you. All your energy should be forced on what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? How can I be used in service? Because Dr. King's message of not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And there is not a job in here that you can do that you don't switch the paradigm to service and not make that job more fulfilling. I don't care what the job is. If you say, I'm a singer, I'm a dancer, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm a janitor, I'm a, I'm a clerk, I'm a, if you say, if I look at this from how do I use this in service 
to something bigger than myself. It no longer becomes a job. It becomes an offering to the world. And that is why you're here. And when you can line up with whatever that is, line up with that. And all you have to do is keep asking the question. And ask the question in purity, not in, when's it going to come? <laughs> you know, like, I'm not looking for a man, but is that him over there? <laughs> <laughs> I played that game. I played that game. Uh, when, when you can do that, then, 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 then it comes. It opens up. Don't you see that? I try to do it every day because if you don't, it's, it's, it's usually a more messed up day. Doesn't mean you don't get through life because a lot of people get through life. It just means your life isn't as enhanced. And everybody who's afraid of meditation, don't even call it meditation. Don't call it that. Just say, I'm going to have, I, I, I have what I call, I have a prayer chair. I have a prayer chair. And then I have just a place where I just go to be still. And the reason why people have so many struggles is because you're struggling against what is for you. You're pushing against it. So when you find that you're not moving forward, you need to stop and get still and say, what am I resisting? What yeah, am I, I also pushing sweat against? Because like so it problem. can't come through if you push against it. It only comes through if you're in flow with it. And it just flows. It flows. And it cannot flow if you're afraid. My spiritual practice is stillness when I first awaken. Allowing myself the moments of awareness and recognition that it is a magnificent thing to be a human being here and now and the glory and beauty of that sustains and has brought me a peace that I cannot even explain there is a richness and a wealth and a peace that goes beyond any material possession or um, award or acclaim or anything that you could acquire the peace of knowing that there is a presence, a force field. I use the word God, but God often seems small compared to what I know it to be. That's really emanating and vibrating through all things. And that I am a part of that, which I call God. We live in a uh, celebrity-obsessed world, don't we? Look at me. Notice me. The Tao teaches something completely the opposite. Listen to the 66th verse of the Tao. Water, again. The sea stays low. And because the sea stays low, all of the rivers and all of the streams empty into it because it stays humble, because it stays in that place of just allowing everything to come to you. He was trying to teach us the important lesson of uh, letting what we know is coming come to us. I practice this so much more now in my life than I did at one time. I can remember years ago, I had written a book called Your Erroneous Owns back in the 70s, and um, it stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for something like 27 months. And many weeks it would be number one, and then it would go down to number three, and then it would go to number two, and down to seven, and all of that. And I was doing The Tonight Show in those days on a regular basis. And um, what you do is you call and find out where you appear on the bestseller list for the following week on Wednesday. You call up on Wednesday, not for the Sunday coming up, but for the following week. And I called home and my ego was pretty strong and I was very much into a lot of notice me. I, I really believe that true nobility is not about being better than anyone else now. It's, it's about being better than you used to be. <laughs> and I think I'm better than I used to be and just about, I mean, I know that I'm better than I used to be in every quality or every characteristic that I hold to be valuable. Um, but in those days, I was into notice me. And I called home and I had trained my wife to uh, call the New York Times. She had this special number 
that she could call and with a certain code and she could find out where I was going to appear on the bestseller list the following week. So I called her up and I said, uh, where am I on the bestseller list next, next week? <laughs> you know, I was out in California doing something and she said, uh, you're not on the bestseller list. I said, what are you talking about? I was number one on the bestseller list last week. I said, my, even my voice changed when I said, no. <laughs> what do you mean I'm not on the bestseller list? She said, you're not on the bestseller list. I'm sorry. She said, your book is on the bestseller list. <laughs> Big distinction there, isn't it? Between believing that this is me and recognizing that, uh, you can let go a little bit of, of, that, of that. Listen to uh, verse 66 of the Tao. Why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Humility gives it its power. That's a very important principle to understand. And I live on the ocean, right next to it. It's my front yard. And always I watch it to learn something from this thing called the ocean, which is the most powerful source of life that we have on the planet. Without it, there's no life on this planet. And because it stays low, so what does this have to say to us? Do you have the capacity to get past that ego need to always be saying, notice me, look how important I am. I mean, there's been a proliferation of this lately with this celebrity silly stuff, isn't it? I mean, CNN is doing you know, full hour shows on uh, on silly little things about what happened to this particular celebrity or what happened to that celebrity, and the celebrity's never even done anything. And it's, uh, there's all of this talk about, it. and all of the new magazines. I mean, and you look, you go into through an airport and you look on the newsstand, and all the same photos, just with different magazines. I don't even know what what the names of all of them are, but there's like this huge market now that we have for people to get into a state of notice me, notice me, notice me. And how much do we train our young people, particularly in our schools and so on, that the one who is the star is the one who gets the most attention. The one who is uh, the most important and the most valuable is the one that has uh, the most people liking them and so on. This constant obsession with needing to be noticed. When in fact, what I have found for myself is the the happiest moments of my life are when I can do it low and slow and not have anybody out there even know what I'm doing. To be able to, I mean, Louise never would have advertised the fact of some of the things I talk about with her generosity. She does it anonymously. It's almost always done in those ways. No, look at me, look and notice me, how important I am and so on. So much to learn from that kind of wisdom, from that kind of inner connection to the Tao, the ability and the willingness to say, to do it anonymously, to say that you can just get done almost anything that you want to get done if you don't become obsessed with taking credit for it. Remember the movie The Magnificent Obsession? A movie made back, I think, in the 50s. And it was really about what was The Magnificent Obsession? It was the ability to be able to give anonymously. What is Alcoholics Anonymous? It is Everybody stays anonymous. Nobody has a title. There's not even anybody in charge. There's nobody, there's no leaders of this. There's no president. There's no vice president. There's no organization. There's no, it's just, here's a group of people who just want to help other people whose lives are out of control. So here's a meeting place. And you come and some, so one day somebody will, uh, will chair it and then somebody else another day will chair it. And one of the things I found when I attend one of these meetings, is that I, I feel, you'll see so many people who are downtrodden, who feel as if their life has passed them by, who look like they don't have any teeth, they haven't shaved, they're, they're dirty, they're God in disguise. Mother Teresa was asked the question about what she does when she was in Calcutta, and she said, every day, every day, I see Jesus Christ in all of his distressing disguises all of his distressing disguises, that you can see this source, you can see the Tao, you can see it when, particularly in those who are the most obscure, the most isolated from everyone else. And whenever I go to one of those meetings and I hear people get up and they tell their stories, they 
I feel there's so much presence of the source, of God, of spirit, of Lao Tzu, of the, of the sort of Tao, whatever you want to call it, in one of those meetings than I've ever felt in any church. I've never felt the presence of it more. And I encourage you, any of you watching this right now, go to one of those meetings. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You don't have to. I'm not an alcoholic. I don't call myself an alcoholic. I was never out of control. I drank, but I wasn't out of control. But I still go to those meetings. I have people in my own family that have struggled with addiction. And I go with them. And I sit there and I listen to those stories. And I just, I get shivers down my back when I think about how beautiful it is to be in the presence of people. All they want to do is help each other. There's a movie called My Name is Bill W. James Woods playing Jim Garner, James Garner is in it. And uh, he, his life just got totally out of control with addictions, totally out of control. And then he went to a, uh, he went to one of these meetings and he began to realize, and he said, we can, we can actually take these people and all we have to do is, all we have to do is love them. All we have to do is, all, and he's so excited about the concept of being able to go out there and, and offer it. And I keep referring to Louise because she's such a hero to me. There was a time back in the 80s when our president wasn't even able to say the word AIDS, was he? I mean, he could come on. And here was this lady who, before this thing became the worldwide phenomenon that it is, was having meetings in her own house and, and, going, and, and bringing these people, these downtrodden people who had been labeled outcasts in society and offering them a place to learn how to love each other and to care for each other. This was long before there was any celebrity state, status associated with trying to end this horrible crisis that our country has and our world has, has had. There was uh, James Wood, so excited about the idea of we can create a place where we're anonymous. Nobody has to know anything about us. We don't have to say our names. We don't have to say anything. We just have to come there and we can help each other. And before that happened, everybody who got out of control with addictions, particularly with alcohol, would, uh, would die. There was no cure. There was no cure. And where did they find their cure? They found it in being anonymous. They found it in being obscure. They found it in having no organization. They found it in having no elected representative. They found it in having no rules. There are no rules. You just come and we care. If you've been one day or one hour sober, or even if you're drunk, you come. We care about you. And you are not that alcohol. Who you are is this divine soul. In the 36th verse of the Tao Te Ching, it says, the gentle outlast the strong, the obscure outlast the obvious. Try to become a little more obscure, a little less interfering, a little less notice me, a little less, you know, one of the specific kinds of things that you can do is just as you're about, when somebody else is talking, just as you're about to interject what you've been thinking about for the whole time, waiting for them to stop talking, just as you, to just stop and to bite your tongue and say, tell me more. Or, that's very interesting. I have never heard that point of view before. Even if they totally, completely disagree with everything that you stand for, to be willing to listen, to be able to stop, practice it. I practiced it when I did these verses of the Tao. I practiced it every single day while I was working on that. Just staying obscure. And for me, that's not always so easy because of just being recognized wherever I go. And if I saw someone who was about to recognize me, I would just put my head down. I would just walk a little bit past them like something. Right now, I just want to be anonymous. Right now, I want to be obscure. The Tao says, storms always end. Verse 23, fierce winds don't blow all morning. A downpour of rain doesn't last all day. Who does this? Heaven and earth. You're already connected to everything you want or need. It will come to you at the exact perfect time as the rivers and the streams come to the ocean at the perfect time and place you gotta trust you gotta know it's going to come to you you don't have to chase after it you can become a little less obsessed with your ego and your self-importance and who you are and what you've done and you can get so much more done and you know what it's the most peaceful and sweet delicious way it's like the song that Cecilia was singing about the rose. 
when we say human potential, unleashing human potential, it is not about reaching the peak, it is a trajectory. Because what our life is, is a combination of a certain amount of time and energy. Time is rolling away for all of us at the same pace. If you sit, it rolls away, if you sleep, it rolls away, if you do something, it goes away, if you don't do anything, it goes away. You're happy or miserable, it goes away. Time is running out for all of us. So it's only the energy that you can do different things with. If you bring your energies to a certain level of intensity and possibility, what somebody does in ten years, you may do it in one year. This means if you live here for hundred years, it feels like in people's impact that you've created, it feels like you lived here for a thousand years, simply because you have managed your life energies in a certain way. So for me, a human being being impactful means, how conscious have you become? This is very important. Because if you're in compulsive cycles, then your energy gets wasted in so many things. If you observe people in a day, let's say, let's take twenty-four hours, in that anyway most people by prescription in America, they sleep for eight hours <laughs> So eight hours means one-third of life is gone. In the remaining two-thirds, they have to eat, they have to, you know, shower, bathroom, this, that, all this, another two, three hours gone. So literally fifty percent of life is gone, daily basis, just for basic maintenance of this life. Fifty percent of the time is gone in maintenance, remaining fifty percent what they have. If you look at every single move that they may make with their body, their thought process, their emotions, you will see a whole lot of it is happening in compulsive cycles. Or in other words, if you are little sensitive to life, you will realize you are the biggest issue in your life. So this is one thing that I'm trying to do with people, that you are never the issue in your life. I'm not the issue. My thought, my emotion, my body is never the issue. My thought, my emotion, my energy and my body are my instruments of function. They are not impediments in my life. But I would say for ninety percent of the human beings, their own body, then the compulsions of the body, the compulsions of their thought, the compulsions of their emotions are ruling them most of the time. The notion of the difference between pain and suffering I thought was very useful. See, pain is physiological, it's there. If there's no pain, most people would not even know how to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. See, just because there's no pain in this, see what all you have done to it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. See, there's no pain in this. So that's why you took it off. If there's no pain in your nose, maybe you would have taken it off. Because there are many advantages, you will take in about twenty-two percent extra oxygen if you just remove this one thing, contraption <laughs> <laughs> Wherever there is no pain, people are messing with it like crazy, isn't it? They call this hairstyle, they call it so many things. Yeah. Suppose there was no pain in the entire body in Los Angeles, people would pull out their stomach bag and <laughs> you think they wouldn't do it? No, I think they probably would. Only pain is helping them to preserve themselves, isn't it? Mm. So pain is good. There's no physiological pain, most people would not know. I hear in the United States there's one group, they call themselves something, I forget that word. They're actually cutting their fingers off, their hands off mm. on the video. Whoa. They're posting it online. There's a group like that. Whoa. Can you imagine this? No. <laughs> in spite of so much pain, if there was no pain, Almost everybody would have cut themselves off in, in the name of fashion, they would have cut themselves into ribbons. Wow. So pain is a good thing physically because that is your preservation, self-preservation mechanism. Mm. But suffering is something that you do in your mind. So pain that happens in your body, you take it in your mind and multiply it a thousand times or a million times depending on how capable you are <laughs> or how stupid you are and suffer it a million times over. Right now, most human beings are like this. What happened ten years ago, they can still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. 
they are not suffering life, they think they are suffering life. They are not suffering life, they are suffering the two most fantastic faculties that human beings alone have, a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. The survival process has become easier than ever before. Believe me, in the morning if you need a bucket full of water, if you had to walk a mile to the river to get one bucket of water, and your family needed twenty-five buckets of water, hmm. you would have no time to mess yourself. <laughs> now you have a lot of time to mess yourself because our survival is better organized than ever before. Hmm. Another thing is, most human beings do not know how to manage their biochemistry without physical activity. I have seen a whole lot of people, particularly teenage boys and girls between the ages of twelve and sixteen, who come to me with some severe violent problems within themselves. If you leave them like that, they may kill themselves or kill somebody else, they're in that kind of state. Many of them have even killed their parents, you know, it has happened all over the world. And uh, in 2017, when I came to know that in India, <laughs> which is not so much suicidal in that sense because there's a huge family support and stuff like that. In spite of that, in 2017, 18,600 children below 18 years of age committed suicide, out of which 7,200 are below 15 years of age. So 12, 13, 14 year olds who must be bubbling with life are wanting to take their own lives. Why? Obviously, we're doing something fundamentally wrong with the society, isn't it? Yes. Our goals and our stupid ideas of what is success is driving them nuts. Because we are trying to use our children like racehorses. That's interesting. <laughs> and when you say that as something to… that represent us, that we've turned into something amazing or in what way are they like racehorses? See, when you understand life as a race, if you're in a race, what's the objective? You must reach the finish line quick, isn't mm. it? Yes. What is the finish line of your life? Death. There you have it. This may not be a conscious process, but life within you is understanding it like that. When you… see, you must understand this, whether you are conscious of, conscious of it or not, any human being. Right now, if you make yourself miserable, you must understand, you are sending a message to every cell in the body that I don't want to live. You might not have articulated it in your head yet, but when you become miserable, you notice suddenly your body seems heavy and it's like, doesn't want to get up from this chair. Have you seen this? Yes. When you're happy, you're willing to bounce at everything and do everything, bend backwards if necessary. Why this is happening is the message has gone to every cell in the body, this guy wants to die. They're all thinking, okay, what can we do to help him? Mm. But by then, of course, you recover. So you want to die, you want to live, you want to die, you want to live. The body is getting confused because you must understand this is a very intelligent body. It's taking instructions from you. Mm. Every cell in the body has enormous sense of memory and intelligence. If you keep sending wrong messages, if they act, you did. Because you're sending contradictory messages, you're not dead, you're half dead. You can give it any number of exotic names. Essentially, you have turned your intelligence against yourself. This is supposed to work for you, but now you've turned it against yourself, it's working against you. When we stop expecting things to be the way that we think they should be, when we stop forcing outcomes, and when we start allowing what is of the highest good to be our only agenda, our only intention, that's when the universe truly has our back. That's when we can live what it means to surrender. True surrender comes when we stop praying for what we think we need and we start connecting and grounding in what could possibly be of the highest good for all. When we stop praying for what we think we need and we start allowing what is of the highest good for all. So true manifesting is about receiving what is of the highest good for all. And it begins not just with what will, how will I get what is of the highest good, but how can I be 
open to what is of the highest good? How can I open up my consciousness to release what I think I need and get grounded in what is possible and what is of the highest good, not just for me and my agenda, but the highest good for all. That's the message. So you're doing everything right in that you're open to a spiritual practice, you're willing to grow, you're showing up for your practice, you're reading books, you're doing the work, you're here on Dear Gabby, you're showing up, you're showing up, you're showing up. You're doing a lot of doing though, and you're also doing a lot of expecting. And so a lot of doing and a lot of expecting are two major blocks to your ability to attract what it is that you want into your life. And so it's the doing, doing, doing that actually creates sort of a manic manifesting vibration, which is how do I get that? How do, what am I, what do I do next? Got to do this thing next, got to do this thing next. And that lacks the belief system that I can be still and I can allow. That's number one. Number two, being in the expectation of what you think things should be is another block to your manifesting power and your super attractor power, which is what I call it, because your expectations are limiting the possibilities. Your expectations are limiting the highest good, as this card says. So when we start to pray for what is of the highest good, rather than intend and pray for what we think we need, that's when the universe can conspire with what it is that is of the highest good for all. So ultimately what's happening is all the doing, doing, doing is energetically blocking and all the expecting, expecting, expecting is blocking the manifestation as well because when you're in this tunnel vision of expectation, it should be this way, I should be further along, I shouldn't be here. What's happening is you're missing the opportunity to recognize where you are, how great things are in this moment, what is possible in this moment, the creative possibility in this moment, the exciting potential in this moment. You're blocking it, blocking it, blocking it, blocking it, blocking it, blocking it. I want you to sit on your ass. I want you to stop doing, doing, doing. I want you to start being, being, being which is what you also said. You're actually dear Gabbying yourself. You said, I want to embody the feeling. I want to embody the emotion. The being is a presence. It's an energy. It's a state. It's not an action. True manifesting does require us to show up for our desires. You know, you got to pick up the phone and then call the job interview and you have to ask for the date and you have to, to do whatever it is that you want to create. But ultimately, the greatest source of power that we have to attract what we want is how we feel. God shows us how to do this in the book of Genesis. The Bible says that God stepped out on nothing and said, let there be something and let there be light. And there was light and, and the evening and the morning was the first day. And guess what? No angels, no choir, no spouse, no friends, no person came along. Nobody started dancing. No praise team came along and said, God clapped for himself. He said, and it was good. And it was good. It doesn't have to be finished to be good. Some of you wait too late to clap. You're not going to clap till it's finished, but you got to clap behind every accomplishment and celebrate every step. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in the way. And every time you take a step, you need to clap for that step because at least I'm further than where I was. I may not be where I'm going, but I'm further than where I was. Am I talking to anybody this morning? And so you need to praise God for baby steps. Praise God for progress. Praise God for improvement. Celebrate within yourself and not be afraid to look yourself in the mirror and say, you did that well. You did that real well. You'll never be able to determine who you need in your life until you feel your own void. You'll choose somebody out of your pain and then when you get well, you don't want them. On the other extreme, but equally as dangerous, but the antithesis of inferiority is the assumption that what God has given to you requires nothing of you. You don't put anything into it. You just receive it, you got it, you think it ought to be there. Anything you add to your life requires your attention. If you have a goldfish, you have to feed it. If you get a cute little puppy, you gotta walk it. 
If you buy a car, you're going to need oil. If you buy a car, you're going to need gas. Anything you add to your life is going to require more of you. Stop adding more than you're willing to maintain. Say this word with me. No. Some of you have said yes so much because you assume that you are collecting whatnots to keep on a shelf, but in reality, you keep saying yes and not really taking care of what you already got. You keep adding more and more and more and more to your life, and then somewhere on some therapist's couch, you say, I'm overwhelmed, and I'm nervous, and I got anxiety, and I guess you do. To him whom much is given, much is required. This grandiose mentality that you have has led you to a place of utter frustration. You underestimate what greatness costs. This is a dangerous thing. You don't seek to keep up advance your skills, study or work out. You don't seek to maintain the relationship, keep it spicy and interesting. You think I got that on lock. You do not have that on lock. You have, come on, come on, come on. You never, you never have it on lock. You don't have your husband on lock. You don't have your wife on lock. You don't have your career on lock. You don't have your child on lock. You don't have your mama on lock. You don't ever have anything on lock. That's why you gotta celebrate people while you have them. You have to love them while you got them. You gotta pour into them while they're there. You don't have it on lock. Somebody is after your job right now. Somebody's after your spouse right now. Somebody's after your house right now. Somebody's after your position right now. Never fall into complacency and think that you are so wonderful that your just being there is all that's required. No, 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 no. Complacency will not do it. You have got to put some grind in it, some sweat into it, some work into it. That's why you don't need too many it's. Because every it you take on is going to take something from you. It's going to give something to you, but it's going to take something from you. And there may not be enough of you to handle all the places you said yes to. And you've got to be able to evaluate. Am I a pint, am I a pint-sized container with a gallon-sized appetite?